The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said as related by Imam Ahmed لَا تُحْتَحَنَّ الْخُصْبُ الْتَنِيَّةِ فَلَا نِعْمَ الْأَمِيرَ أَمِيرُهَا وَنِعْمَ الْجَيْشِ ذَلِكَ الْجَيْشِ The Messenger of Allah said you will surely conquer Constantinople Its Amir will be the most wonderful and the best of Amirs and his army will be the most wonderful and the best of armies. The Byzantine capital was Constantinople. For 1100 years, the Byzantines ruled Christendom. The longest empire, the man who brought them to their knees was Muhammad al fatih 800 years after he prophesied this, this was when Muhammad al fatih rahimahullah, conquered Constantinople. Constantinople for a thousand years was the most beautiful city in Christendom. There was nothing like it in the world. Who were the Ottomans? 1258, Uthman, the leader of the Ottomans was born. His father, Ortogal, always be at the forefront because Ortogal was unparalleled on the battlefield. It was from him in 1258, on the same year that Baghdad was sacked, that he had a child called Usman. Usman is the founder of the Dawlatul Uthmaniyah and also known as the Ottomans. They say it started from a dream. That Usman had a dream that he's sleeping and the heart of a very pious man is transferred into his heart. And then from his stomach, a tree sprouts out and the shade of this tree goes all over the world. He had the dream interpreted. They said that the dream is that your progeny will establish justice where people will live under this justice and prosperity and peace. The Prophet ﷺ was once in the house of Umm Haram. He falls asleep, he wakes up after a while and he's smiling. And Umm Haram anha says, O Messenger of Allah, what's making you smile? May my mother and father be sacrificed for you. The Messenger of Allah said, I saw that a group of people from my Ummah and they're on these large ships, like kings sitting on thrones. So she said, O Messenger of Allah, make dua that I am from amongst them. He said, you will be from amongst them. Then he went sleep again. And after a while, he wakes up and he's smiling again. And Umm Haram radiallahu anha asked him, O oh, Messenger of Allah, what's making you smile? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I saw a group of my people. They're sitting on these large ships like kings on thrones. She says, O oh, Messenger of Allah, make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make me from amongst them. And the Prophet ﷺ said, you will be from the first ones. Come the time of Abu Bakr, nothing happens. Come the time of Umar, nothing happens. Come the time of Uthman radiallahu anhum. Muawiyah now says, Uthman, give me permission to start the naval expedition. So Uthman radiallahu anhu allows him, they go to Cyprus. In this ship is no other than Umm Haram radiallahu anha with her husband, Ubadat ibn Samit radiallahu anhu. They reach Cyprus. Umm Haram is riding the horse. The horse is startled. Umm Haram falls off. Until today, the grave of Umm Haram anhu bears testimony to the prophecy of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But in the time of Muawiyah radiallahu anhu himself, Muawiyah now starts another expedition, and this expedition is to Constantinople. And every single person wanted to be in this expedition. You know why? Many Sahaba had become old. You know why? Because there were two possibilities of prophecy here. One was guaranteed and one was a possibility. The one which was a possibility is that you will surely one day conquer Constantinople. The Amir will be the best of Amirs and the army will be the best of Amirs. So this was possible if they conquered it. But there was another prophecy related by Imam Muslim in the Sahih that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the first army from my Ummah which attacks Constantinople, the city of the Caesar, 
Allah will forgive them all. And this is why every Sahabi wanted to be in this army. You had Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Zubair, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhum. But really the name that really stands out is Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu at this time was over 80 years old. He had the honor of hosting the greatest of creation sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu would live on the top floor. The Messenger of Allah would live on the bottom floor. 80 years old. You are the host of the Messenger of Allah. There's no need for you to go. You're 80 years old. He says the ayat in the Quran, Infiru khifafun wa thiqalan, won't allow me to sit at home. Allah says, go in the path of your Lord. May you be heavy or may you be light. He said, this verse in the Quran will not allow me to remain at home. Imagine this. From Medina all the way to Constantinople. The battle begins and he befalls unwell. He becomes unwell. He withdraws from the battle. Yazid was the general of this army. When he heard that he was unwell, he went to visit him. And he said, Sheikh, what can I do for you? He said, give my salam to the army and tell them that they must fight with vigor. And when I die, make sure that you bury me in the furthest land of the enemies. So I can say to Allah, Oh Allah, I went in your path living and I went in your path whilst I was dead. He passes away and they take him with a procession right to the outskirts of the walls of Constantinople. So Caesar's watching this. He sees this procession. So he sends a message to Yazid and he said, what's this? Yazid said that this is a companion of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it was his desire to be buried as far as possible in the enemy lands. Caesar says, sends a message to Yazid. He says, obviously you're not as intelligent as your father. He said, when you leave, I will exude and I will feed it to the dogs. So Yazid replied, he said, I swear by the one that you disbelieve in. And I swear by the one due to whom he's buried here. If you do that, I will every Byzantine in our lands and I will every church in our lands. It had such a big impact on Caesar that Caesar put permanent guards around the grave of Abu Yubal Ansari radiallahu anhu. Western historians mention that when the Christians would have a drought, they would come to the grave of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari and the Christians would make dua for barakah. Constantinople. What is Constantinople? Istanbul today. Napoleon once said, if the world was one country, its capital would have been Constantinople, Istanbul, because it bridges the east and the west. In 1559, when Queen Elizabeth the first, in 1559, she sent an organ to Muhammad the third. And when Thomas Dallam, who went to deliver the organ, he entered Constantinople. He says, it was like I entered into a different world. He said, I had never seen anything like it. Just from 1123 to 1453, which was the year that Muhammad uh, Fatih lay siege to it. It had been sieged 23 times. The Muslims since the time of the Sahaba until the time of Muhammad al Fatih had laid siege to it 11 times. In holiness, it was regarded as the second Jerusalem. As far as the walls were concerned, it was regarded as the most impregnable city on the face of this earth. 12 miles of wall, 8 miles were water, 4 miles land. It was regarded as impossible to take. Let me move on to the man that I'm going to speak about today. Muhammad Al-Fatih. Who does Muhammad Al-Fatih come from? Muhammad Al-Fatih come from the Ottomans. Who were the Ottomans? See, when the Mongols came into eastern Turkestan, half a million of the Turks migrated to West Turkestan. These were people who were homeless. Wallahi, if there was any group of people who became inheritors of the earth, it was the Ottomans. Homeless, 
destitute, running away from the Mongols. Who were the Mongols? The Mongols were those people who decimated the Muslim world. 1258 was the year that Baghdad was sacked. 1258 was the year which Uthman, the leader of the Ottomans, was born. 1258. His father, Ortogal, when he migrated, he saw two armies fighting, the Khwarjans and the Seljuks, the Shias and the Sunnis. So what he did is that he took the side of the, the Sunnis, the Seljuks. The Seljuks were so impressed by Ortogal's military brilliance, they gave him a certain piece of land. It was from him in 1258, on the same year that Baghdad was sacked, that he had a child called Usman. Usman is the founder of the Dawlatul Uthmaniya and also known as the Ottomans. Usman was known for his justice. I mean, there are many narrations where Usman would judge between a Muslim and a non-Muslim and he would give judgment in the favor of a non-Muslim. And they would say, why do you do this? He said, because Allah commands us to fulfill the rights of other people. Let me briefly tell you who the Ottomans were. The Ottomans are the longest empire that the Muslim world has ever had. No other Muslim dynasty, no other Muslim empire, no other Muslim caliphate lasted as long as the Ottomans lasted. They ruled Iraq, they ruled Egypt, they ruled all of North Africa, all the way up to Tunisia. They ruled Sham. When I say Sham, that means all of the old Sham. The three harams, Mecca, Medina and Al-Quds was under the Ottomans. They were unparalleled. These were the flag bearers. When the Mamluks finished, when the Abbasides finished, when the Khwarizm finished, when the Muahidin finished, there were only one group of people who defended this Ummah for centuries and that was the Ottomans. Ajeeb, Allah says that we want to favor upon those who are taken weak in the earth. And we make them the imma, the imams, and we make them the warithin, the inheritors of the earth. So let me now move on to Muhammad al-Fatih. Muhammad al-Fatih rahmatullah alayhi was the seventh sultan out of the Ottomans. His father was Murad the second. And his father was very, honestly, you know, whenever I've studied the lives of every single Muslim leader, Wallahi, there's two characteristics I've seen in every single one. The first was tarbiyah. The parents were concerned about nurturing their child. They put an effort in nurturing their child. You know, they say about him that he was a son of a sultan. He wouldn't listen to his teachers. And Murad the Thani was so concerned that he said, find me a teacher who can my child. So they found a man called Imam Qawrani. Imam Qawrani was Kurdish. He was known as the Imam Abu Hanifa of his time. And being the son of the Sultan, he laughed in the face of Imam Qawrani. Imam Qawrani was old style. He took out the stick and he gave him a... They say before this, he could barely read the Quran by the age of eight. Muhammad al-Fatih became a Hafiz al-Quran. They say Imam Qurani instilled in him the love for reading and writing. Muhammad al-Fatih could speak up to eight languages. We can't speak English. His main teacher was a man called Aq Shamsuddin. Aq Shamsuddin was the man who instilled in him that he must one day conquer Constantinople. He was the one who took his horse into the sea because the Ottomans were here and then across was where Constantinople was. So one day he took Muhammad al-Fatih and he took him by the shore and then he took his horse into the water until the horse water reached the neck of the horse. And then he said to him, he said, oh my son, one day you will conquer Constantinople. His father Murad al-Thani, he himself lay siege to Constantinople for 22 days. Muhammad al-Fatih would often hear his father making dua for the conquest of Constantinople. Making dua that his son would be the conqueror of Constantinople. You know what kind of tarbiyah he got? You may regard it as old-fashioned. But, but Aq Shamsuddin 
One day he was walking with Muhammad Fatim. Muhammad Fatim is quite young at the time. And he gives him a good... Years later, Muhammad Fatim said to his teacher, he said, why did you beat me for on that day? He said, because my son, you are going to be tomorrow a king. You are going to be the Sultan. If you have never faced this dhulam, when you oppress other people, you won't know how it feels. I did this so you know what dhulam feels like. Second quality, the love for ilm and the love for scholars. His father made him the Amir at the age of 14. He said, you are now the Sultan. The Christians, when they heard it, they're very happy. 14 year old child, he won't be able to do anything. So they decide to attack his land. So he sends a message to his father and he says, Oh, my father, you know, they are about to attack the lands. I need you to come back. And his father said, no, you are in charge. You deal with it. 14 years old. So he says to his father, he said, listen, if you're the Sultan, then it's your responsibility. And if I am the Sultan, then I command you to defend the lands. So then his father comes and takes the reign again. The year that his father passed away, the greatest agitator, of the Europeans. He was the thorn in their side. When he passed away, they were happy. Francesco sent a letter to all the leaders of Europe saying that your greatest agitator has died. His successor is an inexperienced young boy, 21 years old. He said, it's time now to destroy the Ottomans. La ilaha illallah. His father passes away. He's crying at the side of his bed. And his mother comes to him, who just lost her husband, just lost the king. Said, son, get up, we got things to do. They were rejoicing and he was busy with the work. He bought the prophecy of the message of Allah 800 years from before to light. But not only that, the longest empire in Christendom is Byzantine, Eastern Europe. For 1100 years, the Byzantines ruled Christendom. Who was the man who destroyed them? Muhammad al-Fatih. Muhammad al-Fatih. Man prepared. He had, his, he had his eyes on the goal. 21 years old when he became the leader. 23 years old when he lay siege to Constantinople. And you know how he prepared? Meticulously. He made sure everything was prepared. To the degree that he had a man called Urban. Urban was a Christian Hungarian and he was a specialist in making cannons. So he said to Urban, I will pay you whatever you want. You are the best in your field. Can you make me a cannon which is unparalleled in the world? Urban said to him, I will make you a cannon which will destroy the walls of Babylon. You know how big this cannon was? A man could crawl in its barrel. You needed 60 oxes to pull it, 200 men this side, 200 men this side. 13 miles away, you could hear its blast. He raised the taxes where others lived within Muslim lands. He drew treaties with anybody who could impede his mission. The Hungarians, the Bulgarians, all of them he drew treaties with. And then he built what was known as the Bosphorus throat cutter. So basically to get to Constantinople, you had to go through the Bosphorus. They already had one fort on the other side. He built another fort so nobody could get to Constantinople. And then they placed cannons. The narrations mentioned that Muhammad Fatih built it with his own hands. He took off his top. He told his, the, all the princes, take off your tops. He told all the ulama, take off your tops and work. They work with their own hands. Where did he learn this? See, they say he was a half with the Quran and they also say that he was an expert in history. He studied history. He saw when the Prophet wasallam built Masjid Nabi wasallam, and the Messenger of Allah wasallam carried the bricks until the narration mentioned that his back bent over. And the Sahaba said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, we'll carry for you. And the Prophet ﷺ said, you carry that one, I will carry this one. And the narration mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ front and back was covered with dust. This is where these people learned from. Caesar is watching all this. He's in Constantinople. He sees what's happening. 
and he knows that this army is getting ready. So he sends a message to the Pope. We need your help. All of Western Christendom is there. All of Europe is there. We need your help. The Pope said on one condition, because Christianity was divided into two. You had Orthodox Christianity, which was the Byzantines, which ruled from Constantinople and in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu all the way to Sham. And then you had the rest of Christendom, which was Catholics. The problem was that each one of them were putting fatwas on the other. Each one of them regarded the other one as kafir. So the Pope said, we will help you on one condition, that all of you become Catholics. Caesar agreed. So now they come to the Sophia Hagia. They're there, the Pope's delegation is there, they're about to sign that all of orthodoxy will convert to Catholicism. And then the people of Constantinople, they, they become outraged. The second in charge in that meeting stands up and he says, we would prefer the turbans of the Turks rather than the long hats of the Catholics. So Catholicism, the Pope withdraws his help. I ask you today, you ask any Christian in the world, was that statement worth it? They will tell you, no, it wasn't worth it. But we do exactly the same thing. When you're going to learn, we would prefer turban of the Turks to the long hats of the Latin. They lost Constantinople. You know, like you and I cry about losing Spain. Constantinople was far more precious to them than Spain is to us. 1453, they lost this. We lost 1492. We eventually lost Granada. So Muhammad al-Fatih now, he, he, he brings the cannons. Three cannons they have. It takes him two months to bring them to Constantinople and places. And then the battle starts. And they shoot the cannons. The cannons pulverize the walls of Constantinople. The narrations mentioned the women came out of their higher houses screaming because they had, had nothing like this. One Muslim historian, he says that when I heard the cannon by Allah, it was like Israfil had blown the trumpet. And the Christian historians say, but worse than this was when the Muslims would say, Allah Akbar. So that it would make a shiver run down your spine when they would say the takbir. And the walls of Constantinople were very high. So what they would do is that they would shoot the arrows. But they, they, they marvel at the bravery of the Turkish soldiers. Leonardo, who was a contemporary who was there, he says that the Muslim would come close, we would wipe all of them, but the next batch would come. He says sometimes to save one person, 10 would die. But they could not live with the shame of leaving one of their companions unburied. You know, what the French traveler, Breteradon, he says, he, 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 in 1430, he met the Turkish army. And this is what he says about the Turkish army. They are indifferent to where they sleep and they usually lie on the ground. Their horses are good, cost little in food, gallop well and for a long time. Their obedience to their superiors is boundless. You know, Muhammad al-Fatih, when he took his army, the narrations mentioned he went to one marketplace, he would often disguise himself. And the market owner said to him, I have enough to feed my children today. I've watched that market, that person over there. Nobody has come to his stall. You go to his stall. So Muhammad al-Fatih would go to his stall. He went to him, he bought something. He said, I have enough to feed my children today. Go to that stall. Muhammad al-Fatih said on that occasion, I realize now I have the people to conquer Constantinople. Well, why was it possible to have people like this? Because they had a leader like Muhammad al-Fatih. The narration mentioned Muhammad al-Fatih would always be at the forefront. Danish Hilmi says, he's a Turkish historian. He said, since the day he became the Sultan, every single day of his life for two years, he studied the maps of Constantinople. They, they say that nobody knew what his next movement was. 
One of the Qadis once asked him, he said, Sultan, what are we going to do next? He said, by Allah, if the hair on my body knew what I was going to do next, I would pluck it out and I would consign it to the fire. Nobody knew. One morning, you know, because he was a mastermind, one morning what happened was that they created a frame because they were finding it very difficult to scale the walls. They created a frame which was higher than the walls. Three floors, each floor covered with uh, skin. So they couldn't shoot their arrows or pour anything over them. By the end of the day, the Christian managed to burn it down. Muhammad al-Fatih said, no problem, tomorrow we will have another four. One of the Christian historians says, he says, it would have taken the entirety of Christendom an entire month to make something like that. And Muhammad al-Fatih did it in one night. And the next day he said, we're going to make another four. And if that wasn't enough, the tunnels. Muhammad al-Fatih rahimullah began now to dig the tunnels underneath. And now the Christians in Constantinople, they hear about this. And the narrations mention, their own historians mention that they were so scared that they felt that some, any time some Turk will jump out of the floor. This is what Muslims were like once upon a time. They were innovative. They were dynamic. They were diverse. And this is why we had people like Muhammad Al-Fatih Rahimahullah. But you know, there were times obviously the situation was, wasn't very good. Certain times the Muslims found it very difficult. There was an occasion where the ships got through and Muslims lost a lot of men. So then the Sultan wasn't even spared. So the leaders came to Muhammad Al-Fatih and they said, Muhammad Al-Fatih, Sultan, this is all your fault because you listened to your teacher, Aq Shamsuddin. And this is why we are having these losses. So Muhammad Al-Fatih now sends a message to his teacher. He said, what do you say, Sheikh? What's your advice? He said, O oh, Sultan, man plans and Allah plans and Allah is the best of planners. The situation gets even worse. Then he goes himself. And the guard is standing in front of the tent and he's telling the Sultan, even you can't go in. The, the Sheikh said, nobody can go in. Muhammad al-Fatih moved the guard out of the way. He went into the tent. He goes into the tent. He sees the Sheikh, Aq Shamsuddin, rahimahullah. He's in sajda. His turban has fallen off. His hair are on the floor. And for a very, very long time, he's in sajda. And his eyes are flowing. And Muhammad al-Fatih walked out and he said, I swear by Allah, knowing that I have people like this in my ummah gives me greater pleasure even than the conquest of Constantinople. But the morale is down. So what does Muhammad al-Fatih do? Look at this, this is a leader. Muhammad al-Fatih now disguises himself and he goes into the Muslim ranks and he sees the state of the soldiers and then he takes off his disguise and then he gives a speech. He says, oh people, the morale is down. He says, oh people, don't you want to be from that army which the Messenger of Allah said is the best of armies? And then, la ilaha illallah, he points to the grave of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu. And he says, you see the companion of the Messenger of Allah, over 80 years old and he wanted to conquer Constantinople. So what is the state in the city, Constantinople? The state in the city is even worse. Well, they're being besieged. So then what they decide to do is to raise the morale. What they, what they do is that they have this image, Hodjetria, and it's Mary holding Jesus and pointing to him. You know, like nowadays you say, he's the man. She's pointing to him that he is the savior of the world. It was regarded as the most holiest relic in Byzantine. They believe that St. Luke actually drew it himself. And they believe that as long as they have this, that they would never ever be conquered. So what they do on the 25th of May, they put it on the cart. They want to take it to all the sides of the city to bless all the sides of the city. So they take it. And what happens is that it slips out of the hands of the carer and it falls on the floor. Eventually they manage to carry it, but then a torrent comes, the rain comes, and the procession is cancelled. Now they're panic struck. The next day, 26th of May, 
The Sophia Hagia is struck by light. This is Christian historians mention this. Sophia Hagia, the largest church in, in the whole of Christendom, is struck by lightning. Now, Muhammad Fatih has one problem. Subhanallah. He's got his army on land, but he can't get his army on sea because you have 12 miles of wall, eight miles is covered by water and, and four by land. So land is got, but he can't get to the water. Why? Because there's a passage called the Golden Horn. And the Golden Horn has a chain when you enter it. So what the Christians would do is when one of their armies or their ships would come through, they would lower it. When a, the enemy army would come, they would pull it tight and they would rip through the hull of the ship. So none of the Muslim ships could get through. So then Muhammad Al-Fatih pulls off one of the greatest moves ever done by any general. Muhammad Al-Fatih in the darkness of the night, he cradles 67 ships out of the water. He has logs which are lined with grease on them, animal fat. And it's not flat, some places it is 200 feet high. The enemies are all around him. You know when Muhammad al-Fatih said, if the hair on my body knew what I was going to do next, I would consign it to the fire. This is what he meant. In one night, Muhammad al-Fatih rahimahullah brings 67 ships and over the darkness of night without under the nose of the enemies without them knowing and he brings them over to the other side. The Christians, they say that he surpassed Alexander the Great by doing this. Dokan says, this was a miracle that we never heard from before or never after. This was Muhammad al-Fatih. Can you imagine? The morale is already down in Constantinople. And now Muhammad al-Fatih has bought 67 ships. Now they surround them. Now they're not only covering four miles, they're covering 12 miles. Then Muhammad al-Fatih says, he says to his army, he says, tomorrow you light three fires where you normally light one campfire. So they believe that we have reinforcements and then they attack. The morale is already down and the city is about to fall. And then Muhammad al-Fatih sends a message to Caesar. He says, oh Caesar, give us the city. We don't want any further bloodshed. So Caesar says, you know that cannot happen. And then Muhammad al-Fatih says his famous words. He says, either my grave or the throne. Either my grave or the throne. And then Muhammad al-Fatih says, he calls his army. He says, pray at night. La ilaha illallah. And then he gave a speech. He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is close to giving us the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam promised 800 years ago. He said, when you enter the city, Make sure you abide by the laws of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No women, no children, no non-combatants should be touched. Eventually, and the city falls. And Muhammad al-Fatih rahimahullah now enters the city. And Muhammad al-Fatih enters the city later on in the day. The narration mentioned that he was, he was in total and utter humility. In front of him was his teacher, Aq Shamsuddin. And then he reaches the center of the city. And Muhammad al-Fatih, he gathers his companions. A hundred and fifty thousand strong army this was. He's 23 years old at the time and he gives the talk. And he says, remember the words of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. You will surely conquer Constantinople. And you, the army will be the most wonderful of armies. La ilaha illa. And then he walks towards the Sophia Hagia. Some of the Christians, they come out and they go on one knee and they sit in front of him one knee. And Muhammad al-Fatih says, stand up. I am nothing besides Sultan Muhammad al-Fatih. Don't lower yourself for me. And then Muhammad al-Fatih, they go to the Hagia Sophia. And this was unparalleled. This never happens before. He waited for them to finish their prayers. He said, go to your homes. You are all secure. And then that day, the Dhuhr Salah was in Sophia the Hagia. 
Now some say, oh, but why did Muhammad al-Fatih convert the church into a, 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 a masjid? Muhammad al-Fatih is on record as saying that I prefer that next to every masjid there's a church. So for the Christians, they go to the church and for the Muslims, they go to the masjids. But if you compare this, what happened on the other side of the Mediterranean, which was Spain, every single masjid was turned into a church. Not one masjid was left. The Cordoba Masjid, according to many historians, was the largest masjid in the world once upon a time. It was larger than the Haramain. Muhammad al-Fatih converted some churches, but the vast majority he left them to be. So what happened in Christendom? Europe erupted. The Pope actually gathered a special tax to fight the Turks. Frederick III of Germany began to cry. The other leaders all united on to fight the Muslims. But subhanAllah, they could not. Why? Because for the next 30 years, Muhammad al-Fatih kept them on their back foot. He opened the doors to conquer Europe. For the next 30 years, nobody could advance towards the Muslims. Muhammad al-Fatih closed the doors for the Europeans to come into the Middle East. Because Constantinople was the door. So now the Crusades had finished. But what he also did was that he opened the doors on the other side. Muhammad al-Fatih would say regarding Constantinople before conquering, conquering it. He would say this city needs to be conquered because it is the center of evil and transgression. Let me tell you the other places that Muhammad al-Fatih took. So 1453, he takes Constantinople. Serbia, 1453. Moria, 1460. Black Sea, 1461. Wallachia. When Muhammad al-Fatih went to Wallachia to fight Dracula, he saw 20,000 men, women, and children in Muslims. Muhammad al-Fatih was the one who destroyed Dracula. Bosnia, he took Bosnia in 1463. Kalman in 1473. Albania in 1478. Italy, 1481. The Pope was thinking about leaving Rome. That's how scared he was. When they reached Italy, and they are ready to attack Rome and the Pope is thinking about running away. Muhammad al-Fatih rahimullah passes away. 1481. The momentum Muhammad al-Fatih created in fighting the Europeans lasted for 200 years. You know, Abu Muhammad al-Fatih was known by the Muslims as Abu al-Khayrat, the father of good. Because where he lived and wherever he conquered was a land of prosperity and hope. He was the manifestation, the true manifestation of the dream of Osman.